Thank you very much, all three. As you, uh, as you grab a seat at the table so we can have a bit of a moderated discussion, let me point out a couple things. One, uh, at IFPRI, we do a lot of work on seed systems and markets. We're trying to collate that work uh, together to make it a little more accessible on the web. This is a web page we're launching today. Um, and I encourage you all to, to check it out. We'll continue populating uh, the information behind the web page so that you have, uh, you have access to, uh, to this material. We've been doing research on this for, for years and years at IFPRI because, you know, seed is, is the embodiment of technological change in agriculture. Uh, Aiken Barol is one of the many people who have contributed, many others in this room as well, David McConan and others. Um, so let me... Let, let's turn this over to you, because I think this should be a fairly contested conversation. We've been, you know, we've, we've had a polite conversation thus far, but in other forums that I sit in, let me tell you, seed is contested space. It's all about the political economy. Large companies versus small companies, public NARs and seed companies versus, uh, large companies versus small companies, uh, NARs versus the private sector, regulators versus the NARs. Uh, you know, industry associations versus farmers' rights groups. And this isn't an easy area to, to navigate. We happen to have a nice, I think, thoughtful, practical, and pragmatic group here. And I, I think that's the way a lot of these discussions should go, um, rather than, than through polemics. But nonetheless, that discussion is part of talking about seed systems and markets. With that, I hand it over to you um, and ask for your, your questions and ideas. And please identify yourself. There's microphones uh, circulating, your name and affiliation. Yeah, hi. My name is Dr. Tom Herlihy. I'm an independent consultant. This was an extremely rich and really exciting presentation, and I want to thank IFPRI for putting it on. Um, along with what you just said, Mark, I would like to uh, be a little bit controversial and talk about the fact that uh, engagement with partners outside the seed industry is limited including in this forum. This is a seed industry forum. And I want to kind of drill down into that a little bit because I think we're hearing too much about the negatives and the constraints instead of some good examples <coughs> of cooperation. Uh, the Last Mile Alliance, which I worked on when I was with Land O'Lakes uh, and Seedco and Yara and Syngenta, is really making a lot of progress in Tanzania and Rwanda getting those companies that are providing the modern inputs to smallholder farmers to cooperate. They're also marketing uh, their products through cooperatives. In Arusha, they're working with coffee cooperatives, and in Rwanda, they're working with coffee cooperatives. And I think it would have been more interesting if we could have heard about some of these successful examples of how that's going on. I've got a lot more comments, but I'd just like to throw that out there first. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll field a few and, and turn it over to the panel. Uh, anyone else? Carl Prey. Oh, identify yourself. Carl Prey from Rutgers University. Uh, I guess I wanted to target this towards uh, John. I was, I, I was curious to know, and uh, we had a little bit of a discussion about it yesterday, but, but um, who and what interest groups are there that are, are um, you know, holding up harmonization, or, or you know, we um, we talked about you know uh, a few key groups like the bureaucrats who want to be able to keep making money and stuff like that. But I think there are probably you know stronger um, you know economic interest groups also that may be um, uh, you know slowing down the the uh, development of of uh, regulations and also harmonization uh, stuff. So. Great question. Others? Thank you. I'm Peg Willingham with IFPRI's Harvest Plus program. It was a wonderful presentation. I guess I should face one. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's sort of a, a romantic ideas that, that smallholder farmers should be allowed to reuse their seeds and should, you know, really focus on traditional varieties. But it, it seems like, you know, from this presentation, it's clear that farmers in developing countries want what farmers everywhere want, which is access to the best technology available. So can you address kind of the, the tension or where to draw the line or what are the misconceptions that may be well intended by people about what they think farmers want as opposed to what farmers really want? Thank you. Shall we kick it to the panel now? Well, that's three, a good start. Cases of success, 
political interests and, and this question on the small, what small holders want. Uh, why don't we start with you, Ida? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, about cases of success, well, our report really focuses on leadership and um, um, good practices. So maybe they were not, they were in the end of the presentation, so I maybe uh, briefly only touched on, on those. Um, but that's where you learn from. So uh, that's what it's all about. To be honest, we could have easily written a report like, oh, see, see not much is happening. Uh, but we wrote a report, see, a lot is happening already where, where we can learn from. So there are many, many good uh, cases in the, in the report. And I'll take this for my next presentation uh, to uh, pr present more of those cases. Um, maybe the, the last question about this romantic idea. Um, well, when I, when, we st when I started this, um, I traveled through East Africa just to talk to farmers also uh, with them. And I, um, well, I, learned, I heard a lot of things about farmer safe seeds. I'm not myself from the, uh, from the sector. So I was talking to a farmer in, uh, in Rwanda and, I, and she bought seeds. So I said, why, why do you buy seeds? I, I, hear, I hear you all save your own seeds. And she, said, and she looked at me and she said, well, the farmers in your country where you're from, do they buy their seeds? I said, well, I think so. Well, why shouldn't I? Because I've <laughs> I want to uh, grow good crops. I want to send my children to school. Why should I save my own seeds? Um, having said that, um, we want to try to provide an evidence base to the uh, conversation and not have no, our own opinion about it. Uh, so this, I really want to leave this to this, yeah, to the conversation uh, uh, by stakeholders. Uh, but I think it's really important that we also hear uh, from farmers themselves and not uh, uh, from people that only sp speak on behalf of farmers from this romantic perspective. Um, sure, I can say a little bit about the first and the last um, co comments. I think there are, there are lots of cases of success. I'll, I'll just point to, um, I used to work quite a bit in South Asia and, and did a lot of running around speaking with different seed companies, other players in, in South Asia. and it. it Obviously, there's a lot of room for improvement there as well, and I'm sure many people in this room probably have done quite a bit of research on, on you know, what has enabled small seed companies to exist in South Asia when, when they don't exist in, in, in lots of other places where we work. Um, but I, I was always struck by the fact that you do have seeds that are varieties we think of as perhaps public sector, um, you know, wheat, wheat varieties, for example, that are being sold and they are making a business out of it in, in, in India. So, so I think there, there are a lot of successes out there to look at. Um, related to that, we have a project called the Heat Tolerant Maze for, for Asia, a project led by CIMIT, and they've been able to establish public-private partnerships through that project, in fact, have released 17 new maize hybrids in, in just three short years. So I think when you do have the right players at the table, you can really make progress in a way that's not possible when you don't have those players. Um, on, on the last point, I, yes, I think our perspective on, on farmers having access to technologies, not just seed, but, but a whole range of technologies, is, is not so much about developing technologies and making sure that you know, we give them to farmers or that farmers are adopting them. It's about ensuring that farmers have choices and can make choices that they see as necessary to the profit of their business. Their farm is essentially their business. And so if that means helping farmers access training, if they choose to reuse their own seed, at least they could do it in a way that generates high quality seed for them to use. If they decide that that's too time and labor and cost intensive and they would prefer to buy seed, then they should have the option to buy that seed in a functioning marketplace with functioning seed systems. So it's really, it is really about those choices and, and then it, 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 it turns the conversation on its head. It's not about forcing farmers to buy seeds from multinationals. It's about giving them the option to choose what they need for their business. Yeah, thanks. Maybe just to add on that, uh, this point about the kinds of seeds that farmers choose. I mean, r research in Zambia, in Zambia where I live, and I even just talking to farmers, that's the, the research can be as sophisticated as that, or talking to people that I know. I mean, most of the, 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 the small farmers, they'll plant a mix of seeds. They'll plant maybe a third of their field to a hybrid that they're going to grow for cash sale because they, they like the uniformity, they, they like the, the color, the, the, the grain size, and it, it's, it's appropriate for cash sale. They'll plant a bit of OPV seed for, for home consumption because they know it's a reliable performer. Um, they, they, maybe they can't afford all the fertilizer they need, so they'll plant some OPV. And then they'll also plant a, a local land race. Um, there's a variety that's really popular, I think came out of Rhodesia, uh, <laughs> as it, in fact it was in those days, um, uh, called Gankata, which is, is, has a very hard seed coat and, and people love it because it, it, it protects from the weevils and it has a great taste to it. So they'll always, often plant a little bit of that. So it's, it's, I think farmers are not just doing one or the other, they're doing a, a lot of everything. Um, 
so that that's sort of just my two cents on on the the the, the farmer recycle the new and advanced and 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 so on um i think let me also briefly on the successful examples yeah and we we actually heard quite a lot of really interesting stories yesterday in the seed seminar we had at the world bank um about uh, cooperatives we heard about uh, the use of quality declared seed by seed groups in tanzania for for local seed trade um we perhaps lamented the fact that this qdsc that they're using in tanzania can't be traded outside of the district or even more broadly um but it nevertheless it's being used we heard a lot also about small seed companies that are getting set up and, and are going and, and small african indigenous seed companies that are engaging in, in particularly some of these uh less you know the, you you might find that the kenya for instance would appear to have a really well developed seed sector but 99 percent of the seed that's being multiplied is, is maize seed and, and a lot of most of the other crops that are are being neglected but yet yeah, we heard examples of other, some of these other small companies that are getting in, engaged in those crops and then finally the question that was addressed i guess more specifically to me in terms of what what interest groups are holding up the harmonization i mean that that's really you know, we, we could talk in, in, in depth about that, so I don't know how I can sort of try to answer that in, in, uh, before the red panel goes back up. But um, I think it, it's, a lot of times I think it's a misunderstanding of, of what, the, what the rules are. Um, perhaps the person in the seed department and the seed authority didn't even negotiate the, the rules, or they were negotiated so long ago that the person who's now in the seed department doesn't, isn't aware of what was negotiated or the the minister goes off to Addis or, or to wherever it is and signs up but then the, the message doesn't get back to the long way or to, to the capital city to, for the person in the department um, yeah I, I've also I've heard and, and, and there's a lot of political economy fear that if we're going to allow testing you, you talk to the people that are responsible for testing seed and they hang on we're going to accept test results from other countries but I, I get paid for testing seed so so that they're worried about their own jobs um, but then maybe not thinking that actually, well, if we adopt it and if we embrace some of these systems, there's going to be other work in the seed sector that's going to come along and, and I'll be doing even maybe more productive work than just re repeating tests that have already been done elsewhere. I've also heard, sort of, you know, you know, the political economy, thing. I, I don't know, I think the jury's still because none of these systems is really off the ground. But I've, I've heard arguments that if, with harmonization is going to mean that large companies take over. It's going to be a, it's a, it's a plot by, by the Americans to, to take over the, the world of, of our seed technology and to make and enslave the farmers to our, to our technology. But the, on the other hand, I've also heard equally persuasive arguments that by having fewer regulations and fewer barriers, it's going to make it easier for small seed companies to compete, which is also true. So yeah, I don't know how both can be true at the same time. Maybe they are. But uh, again, it's probably a bit too early to, to really know where, where the story lies. I, I hope that's a good short answer anyway. I could add something but with harmonization. Um, I showed you what we found. I didn't show you, of course, what we didn't found. But uh, we expected to see many Indian companies active in East Africa because uh, the step from India to East Africa seems to be quite logical. Uh, we didn't find any seed company active in, uh, in East Africa. And they tell us that that's because those, com those countries are just too small, uh, small markets, and uh, they are waiting for uh, harmonization or the... the, uh, um, uh, the markets to grow before they go there they are actually quite small com uh, companies so they just can't do the investment to have a registration either in every country fair enough um I, I point out that you know what's true and what's not true with, with respect to these these uh regulatory barriers you know and who they favor which which group in the, in the wider political economy gains and who loses it's an empirical question it's something that that institutes like ifpri can and should and probably will and are doing research on. Um, it's something that, that we, we all care about quite deeply. And it's something that really requires uh, better data, better data from, from things like the Access to Seeds Index, uh, greater disclosure from countries themselves on you know, what's, what's been approved, you know, what's, in, what's in testing, things like that. Uh, data and analysis are, are, I think, still found wanting in this area. I mean, that's, that's my take on the issue. Um, let me pitch it back to the audience. Couple more questions. You've definitely got one. Anybody else want to queue something up? And then Frank, and then Mark. And yeah, like I say, this this is a great panel, and I have so much to talk about on this. Yeah. I've been working in seed development uh, for 20 years, more than that. Um, and I was uh, first of all on the point about Indian seed. Although the Indian seed companies aren't in East Africa, their seeds are, because wholesalers are importing their seeds, especially vegetable seeds. Uh, I had the pleasure to work on an aid-funded project in Ethiopia back in um, August, 
And we are trying, uh, Land Lakes, when I was with them, was trying to establish a retail seed dealers. You're probably familiar with this because you used to be in Addis, uh, Mark. And a lot of the vegetable seeds going out are coming through wholesalers from, um, who are importing them from India. But I wanted to get to this point uh, <coughs> in your presentation, Ito, about 2% of the seeds are bought from agro dealers. 2%. And I, I wanted to hear from all of you about the impediments, because seed companies are not in the business of retailing seed, okay? I worked with all the seed companies in all of East Africa, including Seedco, Zamseed, uh, Syngenta, Monsanto, DuPont Pioneer, all of these people. It's not in their business. It's not part of what they're doing. What they want to do is sell to the retailers, which is one of the reasons the Last Mile Alliance is hooking up with cooperatives. So I'd like to hear a little bit more if your research, and I know Aid funded a lot of agro retail dealer funded projects in Malawi and Tanzania and Uganda and other places, about the barriers to getting the seeds in small packets that can be sold at small dealerships at the end of the last mile. Because there are impediments. In Ethiopia, there's huge impediments. Uh, you can't own the land on which you set up a shop. So how are you going to set it up? Often there's no financing out in the rural areas where these retail shops need to be set up. So I was wondering if the panel could address those problems that SMEs, the agro dealers face. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks. Frank, please. Thanks. Uh Hi, yeah, I'm Frank Place from uh, IFPRI. Um, so we heard that there's a multitude of different problems that are um, affecting the, you know, the seed sector, and, and we've also heard it's a long-term process. And so I was wondering if there's some ex good examples at national level of public-private partnerships or other kinds of forums or processes which uh, are very encouraging in the sense of, of really see seeing this through uh, over a longer term to, to tackle problems at national level. Thanks. Uh, Mark Senga. Yeah, I think this one's mostly for Ido. Um, to what extent did you consider as an indicator uh, seed companies' uh, treatment of outgrowers? And I ask that question because, especially in East Africa, there's that, that's actually a considerable differentiator among seed companies, how they treat their outgrowers. Are they laying all the risk off onto the outgrowers, or are they uh, sharing the risk with the, uh, the outgrowers? So uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on that. And quickly identify yourself. Mark Heising with USAID. Excellent. And Rachel. Uh, Tara, up in the front, please. Thank you. I'm Rajal Pandyalocha at IFPRI. Two questions, one for Ido. What is happening in West Africa? You kind of glossed over that, and I was so intrigued quite what's happened there and what is going to be happening there. And the second question is more general to any one of you, including David. We talk so much about food prices, food price volatility, rising food prices, dropping food prices. Our life is consumed by food prices. But you never hear, at least I as a naive layperson, don't hear about seed prices. Is anything happening in seed prices that we should be aware of, or is everything happy, happy, happy? Thank you. <laughs> it's happy. Um, let me pitch it to the panel, and then we've got at least two questions for the next round, which is fantastic. Uh, let's start at the end, then, with John um, come through. Let's, uh, yep. OK. Um, I was going to take a moment to, to, to get my thoughts together. Um, I mean, there's a question, I don't know that was really addressed to me, but there's this question of why is so little seed being sold by the agro-dealers? And I think one of the things that, that, that comes up, and we, maybe this also gets to your question on what's happening in West Africa, because one of the things we definitely found in our research uh, looking there, and as I indicated, alluded to in my presentation, is the, the restrictions on variety ownership where companies may not have, uh, only have access to, the, either, either you don't have exclusive rights to that variety, or you're relying 100% on the state re to, to provide the breeder material, so this, the seed companies simply become companies that are multiplying the seed. And then you have, I think, less interest in, in certainly in promoting the variety or marketing the variety, and arguably even less interest in quality control. Um, 
a, a large C company, I forget which one, w was telling me that they had uh, developed uh, striga resistant uh, maize and sorghum, but now they, they finally got it uh, approved, but then they had only five years of exclusive ownership and they couldn't start to even bulk the seed before, you know, before the, 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 the license was granted. And they say it's going to take us at least three years or four years to bulk the seed and then we, and, and we can't, uh, until then we can't start doing our demonstration plots and really marketing the seed. And that to me stands in sharp contrast with the other parts of Africa that I'm more familiar with. You, you drive in East Africa, Southern Africa, you know, along the, the, the highways and you'll see all of these demonstration plots out there. By, by the side of the road you have, you know, the Panar, this, that, or the other, seed code, this, that, or the other, this, you know, so that the farmers and the, and the people can see what's going on. But you, you, but you don't see that so much in West Africa. And, at least to my mind, anyhow, some of it, it relates to the, the ownership and what, the, what roles created there for the private sector. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I guess, my two cents. Sure, maybe two points. One on the agro dealers, there's a lot more that could be said on that, but I'll just note that obviously they are part of the seed system. And, and as you note, restrictions on just running a business obviously will then impact agro dealers and their ability to run their business of selling seed. But you could also flip that around. Agro dealers potentially play an extremely important role in disseminating information. So to the extent that they're not just selling seed, but if they're also able to provide the knowledge that goes along with that seed, they can serve an extraordinarily valuable role. And so thinking of it from the development perspective as a donor agency, programs to work along the entire seed system to include those agro dealers that go beyond just enabling them to sell seed, but actually putting them in the position of doing demo plots, say perhaps behind their business, uh, is extremely valuable. When I was working in India, and I'm going to forget the name of these, what were those serv the centers called? The Bazaar. Yes, the Hariyala Kisan Bazaar. Maybe it's not a great example because, I, as I understand it, they essentially didn't work out and had to get closed. But they were these sort of one-stop shopping for farmers, where you could go and buy your seed, you could buy your your, your fertilizer, you could get information, you could get a, a cell phone. And we were one of our projects was working with them to put in place demo trials behind the facilities where farmers could see all the latest varieties come out and do comparisons with their traditional varieties. So, hugely important role to play. On, on the volatility of seed prices, I don't have a lot to say on that specifically, but I think it's a very good point that seed cost can be a major issue. And so maybe stepping way out of the discussion, thinking about technologies and, and R&D, there are a lot of innovations in R&D that can really bring down the cost of producing, especially hybrid seed, which for maize is, is costly, but thinking about crops like rice, where biologically it's just even more difficult to produce hybrid seeds. So, uh, certainly, there are lots of ways to think about reducing cost, and one of one of them is the efficiency of, of seed production. Um, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, but um, I think seed companies are in the business of selling their seeds. Um, I didn't understand it as an indicator. Oh no, no, no! I was I was referring to the first question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, what's the use of developing seeds if you can't sell them? Uh, but we see different strategies. Uh, some companies make use of the agro dealers. Uh, some explicitly don't want to use uh, agro dealers, so they choose direct uh, contact with farmers like Rijkswaan, they, but they go to the high end of the market. Uh, others work through uh, cooperatives. So you see, you see different uh, uh, strategies. Um, uh, Public-private partnerships, well, one of the uh, good examples that was mentioned in our, in our report is the uh, AMSEP uh, program by USAID, um, uh, Advanced Maize Seed Adoption Program, which was visited last year by Pro uh, uh, President Ob Obama. Um, this is one of the, oh, you asked a question. Um, this is w w one of the successful programs where you can see that public and, and private sector work together. It's, it's USAID and, and uh, DuPont Pioneer. Um, Treatment of outgrowers, indeed, is not an indicator. Uh, I have written that, that one down. Um, uh, interestingly, we, we don't have production in our global uh, index, but we do have it in a regional index um, as a special uh, field uh, because it was deemed uh, important by the regional expert review uh, committee. Um, we have asked uh, companies whether they adhere to s social standards, but we didn't go deeper to really how did they treat uh, outgrowers. So maybe that's something for the next round. Um, what's happening in West Africa? Well, uh, not much. Um, well, there, is, there are some projects, uh, and what we found is uh, it's mainly uh, um, vegetable seed companies. Um, 
what I uh, there is uh, Technisem, which is a company that's in our East uh, African index, um, is very active in West Africa, and they're doing a great job. But they were just too small to include in our global uh, evaluation. But they are really active in uh, in West Africa. But if there's anything happening, it's mainly a vegetable seed, and I think it has a lot to do with the policy environment, but also yeah, market opportunities. Um, Seed prices, um, well, something that we found interesting is that, uh, for instance, East African seed is um, using price lists for their uh, distributors. So farmers know which, for which price the seed should be sold because it's known that many of the middlemen, they just add something up uh, to the price. So that's something they want to cut out the power of the middlemen. So that these are practices that we, f that we found. To kill two birds with one stone on, on prices and, and, and outgrowers, the, the demand for seed is derived from the demand for the commodity that's being produced, right? So you'd only pay so much for seed as you think your crop would command uh, in the market, whether it's wheat, rice, uh, else, or for own consumption, of course. Uh, I think the general trend has been in real terms that, that global seed prices have been increasing, uh, not dramatically, unless you're talking about a, a seed that embodies a, a transgenic trait and then intellectual property rights, royalties, and things like that come into play, and those, the, the price of those seeds are quite uh, tremendous. In some cases, uh, the, the introduction of hybrids, like hybrid rice, um, does increase seed prices as well, uh, somewhat offset by, the, um, by the, a lower seeding rate and a higher yield from those seeds. Um, but, but what that gets back to, with respect to Mark's point, is that in, in many ways, you know, you have to treat seed and, and outgrowers as, as high-value contract farmers, right? I mean, that's sort of the evolving model, and that's somewhere that, that we need to do, I think, a lot more work on, thinking about seed production as the same as, you know, the production of asparagus for, for Walmart or whoever, you know, sells it at, at a premium. Um, and, and understanding the, the importance of building those value chains uh, has a lot to do with the price of seed, what farmers are willing to demand, for seed uh, and what they're willing to pay. So, so that's something that I think we need to explore even further, especially with respect to outgrowers. Uh, again, let me. Just on, on the price point, yep. they didn't have that paper by yesterday where it showed the price of prices. How many? When it's bought by, when, when donors are. When donors are in the market, right? It's, it, was, it was quite a stark difference. When there's no donors in the market, then the seeds were selling for a lot less. So, yeah. It's very interesting. Um, as a donor, I'm, I'm sure you're scratching your head over that. <laughs> uh, Karen Brooks and then David Giselquist and, and Carrie Plates, right? I'm Karen Brooks from IFPRI. I'm also the director of the CGIR <coughs> Research Program on Policies, Institutions, and Markets. And as I listen to this really interesting um, discussion, I'm struck by how important the issues are and how long they've been with us. And they, they seem really durable. And I think in some parts of the world they've been solved and in others they really aren't moving as one would think they could. And can we perhaps learn something from the fact that we have these indices now that look at different issues across regions? Do we learn something new about the um, the pace of resolving some of these issues in parts of the world and, and the slower pace in others. And how should we think about these issues differently so that in 20 years we aren't having the same very interesting discussion? 20 years is a short time in the seed industry, I think, but uh, <laughs> you make a very good point. David. For that question, Karen, and uh, thank you for the panel presentations. Uh, I'd like to follow up. Uh, uh, introduce yourself. I'd just like to follow up with what Karen said. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've been uh, uh, talking about some of these things for 20 years, and, uh, and uh, I'm seeing some movement now. But I'm still wondering, um, I mean, we, it's, it's fairly clear that a lot of the, we, we talk about political economic problems, and it's fairly clear that the NARS are, are holding things up, uh, a variety introduction in particular. And uh, so, but the question, and the NARS are, uh, they, they get persistent advice from the CG systems, from, C, you know, from CGIR. Uh, from the donors, from they get projects, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, but uh, over the years, they've not been getting persistent, consistent advice to open the seed systems. 
they haven't been getting persistent advice that <coughs> that uh, all the varieties aren't going to come from the public sector. You got to you got to allow the private varieties in. Now, um, what's the problem with that? Is it a political economic problem within the CG system, uh, or is it a lack of uh, knowledge, a lack of information? What's going on? Why? And if if, if we don't make that change, then countries like Rwanda are going to have to decide on their own that oh, we're going to do what's good for our farmers. We're not getting that advice from anyone, but we're going to do it. Are we going to get in front of this or not? Terry. Uh, that's David Gizelquist, independent consultant. Hi. Carrie Wright Plutice. I'm also EPT here at IFPRI. Um, building actually on the last two questions, I'd like to know a little bit more information about the regulatory environment because I think you all touched on it just a little bit, but it seems to hold the key for seed and plant material flow and especially across boundaries and countries. Who's doing it right and how are we learning lessons from each other? All right, I'm going to kick it back to the panel and take moderator's privilege just to comment on David Gizelquist's remark. Is the CGIR complicit? He's always the iconoclast. But there is a very big question here. Are the CG centers and their NARS partners, of course, complicit in this sort of political economy, this rent-seeking behavior, saying, all right, we know how to navigate the regulatory system. Therefore, we don't really want it to change because we've specialized, we're good, we've got jobs. It's working for us. Is that a valid, is that a, a valid concern or constraint? Uh, some of our partners, like in Harvest Plus and elsewhere, work very closely with CG centers and they work very closely with regulatory uh, systems. So it's a, it's a big issue. It's a big issue to think about. Um, let me kick back to the panel, if I may. Um, uh, starting maybe with Sahara Moon. Oh, boy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's why contested space. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> I'll just say I've learned a lot from the talk about the indices today. That, that was one of the questions. Um, I can't really say yet, you know, how I'm going to go apply that in the work we do. But I think having this information um, is really important. And, and being, you know, given that USAID's in the position of designing programs and interventions and thinking about how we engage with national governments, we obviously have many, many platforms with which to engage on all the various <coughs> players. Having the information and really understanding what's working and what's not working is incredibly important. I'll just say that. John. Yeah, I, I can maybe chime in a little bit. I, I think that, um, I mean, the, the role of the CG centers, I mean, the people here will know much more about that, but I mean, the, the, than I do. But I guess the, the, there's this issue that, that I sort of jotted down, which is true that the, the, these public research institutes seem to be very poor. They have a very poor track record of commercializing varieties. These are researchers. They research, they develop the varieties. You get your PhD or you get your whatever out of that, and you, you develop the variety and then count it as a success rather than getting it out into the field. So, so what's driving that? I don't know. I mean, I think one of the points that I put on my slide, I'm not sure how much time I spent talking about that, is uh, perhaps this idea of giving then exclusive ownership to uh, or a time-bound ownership for an extended period if you continue to meet certain conditions to, to a variety, to, to a, a local seed companies. Maybe companies that don't have the, the capacity to do their own research, but they want to breed the seeds. So they want to get ownership of a particular variety and then go out there and do the demonstration plots. And we're going to take the, take the time out to, to go out and advertise what are the advantages of that variety and, and promote that amongst the farmers. Um, I've also heard uh, people from CG centers tell me that, no, we're not going to register our varieties in the regional catalog because they're public varieties. There's no need to register them. But, you know, that, that kind of misses the point, and that, I guess, goes back to what I said before, that often these, the, these regional regulations are not really very well understood. Um, and then maybe just one other thing that I kind of had wanted to mention earlier, like, you know, in West Africa, I don't, you know, I don't know to say that nothing is happening there. It's, it's, that's kind of a bit of a, um, a, a bit harsh. I mean, I, I think that they're, they're certainly far behind, and they're, they're, they're definitely facing many challenges, but one of the things that that we, we discovered doing so, some research in, in West Africa, looking at both of the seed and fertilizers, that, yeah, okay, they don't have the capacity to implement the harmonized rules, but actually even, you know, I don't know if this, but just the, the, the process of discussing the rules and dis discussing the problems really sort of helped to focus people's attention on the issue, uh, got, got people talking about what are the problems th through, through the harmonization process, You've got com countries that are that are now that, that never had a seed committee before that are developing the seed committees. They're they're writing down the rules for seed regulation rather than just before having it be something that can be made up at the end of the day. Uh, so you know it, it's little bits like that that are probably making some practical differences. Um, yeah, and maybe to, to to leave it there. Um, 
Well, the question about who's doing it right. Um, John, the, uh, he uh, showed the TASAI uh, results or parts of it. Uh, what I liked about that is that they don't try to answer who is doing it right, but they show that some, com some governments are doing some things right. And, uh, so there's no, no government is doing nothing right. But you can learn something in Burundi, you can learn something in Rwanda, uh, and you can learn something uh, in Kenya. So everywhere something is, is, going, is going well. Um, well, that's, that's what we're discussing now. I mean, our index is, is out since uh, three months. So we are looking now in how can we integrate uh, their findings, our findings, and the findings of the World, uh, the World Bank and see how we can uh, move it a step further. Um, and so can we learn something new? Yes, I hope so. I, <laughs> I, I surely hope so. When we started this, uh, some companies said, why are you looking at us? Look at uh, go uh, government first. Um, so I was really happy uh, to learn about the TASAI and about the World Bank because we, we could say, well, that's, uh, that's been done already, so that's why we look at you uh, now. Um, I don't think it's useful to first wait until governments have all, all done all their uh, homework and then uh, companies uh, move in. And I think we don't have to wait because a lot is happening already. Great. I had a question here. I think this is the last round of questions. Am I going to get a red flag? Like we've got like one or two last questions. I can't leave this topic. I'm like a kid in a candy shop. <laughs> Anne-Marie Throw from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And my question is, um, watching over the last decade or two, you have all recounted about significant private sector cooperation and activity in the seed sector here, and I'm wondering if there are lesson learn, lessons learned or trends that you can pull out about what is encouraging or inducing the private sector to be involved there. Great, and anything, I can actually take a stab at that very quickly, but I'd say hybrids. But um, you guys can be more sophisticated in your response. Anything else, last question, last chance? Sold, go ahead. Determinants of increases in, in private sector investment in small, in developing country seed systems. <laughs> 30 seconds go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it, it, it again, it comes back to the enabling environment and the regulatory environment. And we, we certainly, yesterday, we, we did talk about a lot of success stories and uh, countries such as South Africa, for instance, that has relatively easy and straightforward uh, variety release procedures. And the, the number of varieties that are coming onto the market there are, are far greater than elsewhere. Um, in my presentation, I gave some examples of Turkey and Bangladesh and, and others that uh, I think also point to the, 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 the importance of matching your regulatory ambitions with your actual capabilities and being realistic about what you can achieve. And, and then you do get, get so some, some pretty notable and, and pretty important results in terms of, of yields and farmer choice and, and so on. Um, and then maybe just lastly, before I, before I yield the floor, just to give a small plug for something that we're doing at the World Bank, which is um, Seeds for All Community of Practice. Those of you that would have been at the uh, workshop yesterday will be aware of this, but we have uh, an online discussion going. We're, we're developing some uh, seed toolkits and information on uh, best practices in seed policy. But uh, hopefully through, we can coordinate with IFPRI that you can all get an invitation to be a member of the online community of practice where there's uh, debates are, are, are ongoing and people are able to post their, their blog thoughts on, on different issues on seed. So maybe although we're about to wrap this up, that could be a, a good place that we might continue some of the discussion. Great. And Sarah Moon, you know, last 30 seconds. I'll just say that I think what we've learned under Feed the Future is that working with the private sector doesn't just happen. It, it, it's, it's an area that requires its own sort of knowledge and investment and, and know-how. And so it, it doesn't necessarily require a tremendous amount of resources, but we found that, that many private sector companies are very interested to come to the table and, and work in the development space as a business, not as, as CSR, but, but really as a business. But, but they need information. They need uh, sometimes assistance in really understanding regulations, how they can work, where are the entry points. And so I think that taking that kind of very methodological approach to working with the private sector can, can have real benefits. Hey, no. Um, well, I think that um, our index also shows that a lot of progress is made, uh, especially in South and Southeast Asia. And um, you see an emerging industry in, the, in East Africa, um, not nothing, but not so much happening in, in West Africa. Uh, but you see these, these differences, and that's what uh, well, you, you can learn from it. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for your spirited conversation and input, and I hope we keep this discussion going further into the future. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.